It was exactly one year ago today that a mob of Trump supporters, white supremacists, our militia members, and other right-wing extremists stormed the Capitol in an act of terrorism aimed at trying to overturn the results of a free and fair presidential election at the behest of the man who lost, as the man who won addressed today. This was an armed insurrection. They weren't looking to uphold the will of the people. They were looking to deny the will of the people. The former president of the United States of America has created and spread a web of lies about the 2020 election. For the first time in our history, a president had not just lost an election, he tried to prevent the peaceful transfer of power as a violent mob reached the Capitol. But they failed. That they did. But what about the next attempt? Extremism experts have warned for decades of the growth of right-wing movements in the U.S., including their infiltration of the U.S. military and police departments nationwide. And Donald Trump's blatant use of xenophobia and racism to build his political brand and amass millions of followers made for an easy organizing strategy for American extremist groups ranging from white supremacists and neo-Nazis to anti-government groups of many stripes, groups that have not gone away. So what motivates people to grow their unfounded and irrational hate of another group into armed radicalization? And is there anything that we can do about it? Joining me to discuss are Robert Pate, a professor of political science at the University of Chicago and director of the Chicago Project on Security and Threats, and Robert Tristan, the Anti-Defamation League's New England Regional Director. Welcome to both of you. Thank you for joining. Robert Pape, I, I want to start with you and, and, and just ask, um, mm -hmm. the, what we're learning about the people who were arrested, who were part of the riot, and as the FBI has said, you can't have a riot unless people showed up, many of them were had no real history of violence, had no association to organized hate groups. What motivated them to be there? And are those types of people the threat that we're worried about today, in addition to those other threats that we have identified? Uh, right. Well, it's important to go further. Um, they also, over half of them, are business owners, CEOs, and from white-collar backgrounds, doctors, lawyers, architects, and managers. Only 7% were unemployed, nearly the national average. So these, this isn't coming from the margins of society. They're mainstream. The most important thing to know about violence in the mainstream, when there's community support for, the, for violence in the mainstream, is it makes it easier to rationalize action when we think we have community support for our actions. So the more we think that the community supports the idea that Joe Biden is an illegitimate president or that the use of force is justified to restore Donald Trump to the presidency, the easier it becomes for any one individual to act. Why? First of all, there's a public mandate now. This isn't just criminal behavior anymore. When you have a mainstream support for political violence, suddenly it's a mandate. Also, you have the idea of safety in numbers. If a mob, a large group acts together, they can believe, well, maybe I won't get caught or I won't do X, Y, or Z. Now, they may get caught down the road, but at the time, this idea of community supported the mainstream is much more dangerous than people who may not study this subject realize. Yeah, I want to throw to one of the uh, people, uh, Joshua Pruitt, who is uh, an accused capital writer, um, had this to say. You asked me if I do it again. I want to say yes. I don't feel like I did anything wrong, but knowing the consequences that came out of it, would be the part that would make me question it. I was just a patriot out there, you know, um, protesting against um, I, what I think is a stolen election. Robert Tristan, for those of us who are members of, of vulnerable groups, uh, being a woman, being a lesbian, being a member of the Jewish American community, um, this wasn't so shocking to some of us. However, uh, it still is disturbing. And folks have been warning about things like this that, that could happen. What's your message to people who may just finally be taking this extremism and uh, this violence seriously? 
Well, the threat, it's, you know, at one point we may have been saying it could happen here. Uh, I think it has happened here. And I think there are a lot of groups, uh, marginalized groups, uh, some of whom you just mentioned, who have experienced this kind of uh, mob mentality and violence coming into their daily lives. Uh, you know, the Capitol insurrection is one example. People experience it in different ways every day. And we saw that uh, when you sort of drill down and look at some of the symbols for the people that were extremists. Now, we, you know, we just said not everyone who was, in, was affiliated with an extremist group who was in the building that day. But when you drill down and you look at those that were, uh, racism, anti-Semitism uh, was fueling some of their beliefs. And I think, you know, overall, one of the lessons here is that misinformation and lives motivates and incites people. And you don't have to be part of an extremist group or be chatting online all day long about a particular ideology to suddenly be motivated and feel that this is okay for me to act in this way. Robert Pape, one of the double-edged swords of uh, political organizing is that we we often tell people to get inv involved at the local level, right? Not, you know, don't run for senator. You don't necessarily have to run for president. You can run for school board. You can run for school committee. You can run for town meeting. And as we saw in Michigan um, when uh, in 2020, in October, when there was a plot to kidnap Michigan Governor uh, Gretchen Whitmer, um, Many of these folks that travel to Washington are just the tip of the iceberg in some of the efforts that are happening on the local level. And when we talk about violence in the, in the political discourse, we're not just talking about what happened last year. We're also talking about what's happening to public health officials and school committee members. Can you talk a little bit about how that's a threat to all of us? Yes, absolutely. So also your listeners might want to know, I've been on the school board in Vermont, so I have an idea of what this local politics is like. And um, uh, also you should know that when I was on that school board and like a lot of school boards, we never talked about violence. The whole idea wasn't organized around violence. What uh, we've conducted nationally representative surveys, um, multiple in the last uh, nine months. And what we see is that the equivalent of 21 million Americans hold two radical beliefs. One, that Joe Biden is an illegitimate president. And two, the use of force is justified to restore Donald Trump to the presidency. That is a really big thing. Because what we're seeing is not just vague misinformation or so forth. These surveys are very pointed, and we're and we're also seeing consistency. That number 21 million has not shrunk over time. Mm -hmm. What that means is there is a mass of community support for violence for very specific political goals, not just vague ideas. Um, and this is really why it's so concerning as we get I'll go forward in the 2022 election season, because this is like a mass of dry wood in wildfire season that can be touched off by a lightning strike or by a spark. We can't predict the lightning strike or spark. What we can do is measure the size of that combustible material and it's too big. And it's so big that in fact, it can create that idea, as I said, of safety in numbers. You can start to get the idea that it can bubble up. Oh, my, my not, maybe not everybody in my town agrees with me, but some people do agree with me and then they will see me as a patriot, just as the person you showed on, uh, on the clip. Who are they thinking sees them as a patriot? Those 21 million. Robert Tristan, that's that's the number. You know, we've been talking about these surveys and percentages, but when you actually hear what the number of Americans who believe that is, it's it's startling and striking. And as we enter the midterm election year, and then that immediately leads to the presidential um, uh, race that begins. What's your message to folks watching um, about what they can do? And again, this, these surveys are both of Democrats and Republicans. There are more Republicans who believe this this way, but Democrats are not immune from it. What's your message? What can people do to take action to defend democracy, uh, defend our democracy, and to try and keep or reduce the opportunity for this from happening again? Well, number one, it's a regardless of your political affiliation, the, the, the concept that political violence is okay in the United States is a threat to democracy. And that's, that's irrespective of 
how you may vote or how you voted in the past. And I think that message is really, really important. And we need to have a groundswell of um, people from across the spectrum who push back on that message. And political violence is not part of American democracy. We need to get that message out there. And we need to encourage people to participate in the process, which means voting. And it means interacting with your elected officials. It means running for office. But it doesn't mean uh, storming a state capitol or the capitol in Washington. Robert Pape, it seems really hard to have this discussion uh, about how this is a threat to all of us when at the ceremony today there were only two Republicans there uh, at, at the congressional um, moment of silence. One of them was sitting Representative Cheney and the other was another Cheney, former Vice President Cheney. Uh, other Republicans chose to sit it out. It's very hard to communicate this message to just regular folks watching at home when it doesn't seem that the message is getting beyond party lines. Do you have any advice we, on how to how to make that go away and try and get some unity on this issue? Uh, we have a big opportunity coming up. The very fact we're having an election means we can ask every candidate for every office in the country the same question we ask in our University of Chicago Project on Security and Threat poll. We can add, we found some Americans believe the use of force is justified to restore Donald Trump to the presidency. We can ask every candidate running for office before we vote for them, what do you think about that? What do you think about that? So this isn't about pointing fingers and getting someone to sit them down and change your mind. People are running for office. Let's ask the critical piece of information we need to know. Are they on the side of democracy or are they on the side of violence? As uh, we close out here, Robert Trust, what are, what are your reflections on, on last year at this time and, and what are your, your hopes moving forward? Well, one of the lessons is the, the danger that misinformation and lies and uh, you know the impact that it has on people. And I think that is something we've seen in the last 12 months, that it continues to circulate, to flourish. And we need to prevent, uh, we need to prevent a movement of political violence in this country. So, you know, there, there's some profound sadness when we look back on what happened 12 months ago. But I think there's every reason for everyone to be motivated to, uh, to support democracy. Robert Pape, Robert Treston, Happy New Year to both of you. I appreciate your insight on this. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure.